Hi, this is Stephen, and today we'll be covering the pathophysiology of Parkinson's and Huntington's disease in this video. So, this video will consist of an introduction to Parkinson's and Huntington's. So, this will consist of three questions, which we will review again at the end to test your current knowledge. We'll go over what Parkinson's is, what Huntington's is, and the difference between the two of them, the symptoms of each, the pathophysiology of each, and some tips in the clinical examination and history. And then we'll finish with the same questions we start with in order for you to assess how you've progressed through the video. So to begin with, what do you already know? So question one, what are the cardinal signs of Parkinson's disease? And then I'll put all of the options up and give you a second to pause the video in so that you can work it out. Again, we'll visit these at the end of the presentation and review why the answers are what they are. Okay? So the cardinal signs of Parkinson's are bradykinesia, rigidity, and tremor. So the next question is, Huntington's disease is caused by what? So Huntington's disease is caused by a CAG triplet expansion on chromosome 4. We'll come into this again later on. And then the third and final question is, Huntington's disease is, and then these four options. So the answer is a dyskinesia. So again, we'll cover this in depth as we progress, but the major symptom of Huntington's is chorea. Chorea is a type of dyskinesia, and I'll explain further on why it's not any of the other answers. So to begin with, into the main meat of the presentation, what is Parkinson's disease? So Parkinson's disease is a chronic neurodegenerative disorder of the basal ganglia. In simpler terms, it's a movement disorder classified as an akinetic rigid syndrome. Akinetic rigid syndromes consist of slowed, decreased movements, also known as bradykinesia, and increased muscular tone. So speaking epidemiologically, Parkinson's is the commonest of its type worldwide, and it's more common in males, the median age of onset being 60 years. So now to move on to Huntington's. So Huntington's disease is another movement disorder. It's categorized as a dyskinesia, and it's also called Huntington's chorea. It's a progressive autosomal dominantly inherited neurodegenerative disorder, and as it's a dyskinesia, dyskinesia means abnormal involuntary movements. The type of involuntary movement seen in Huntington's is known as a chorea, which is irregular, jerky or fidgety motions that's continuous and move unpredictably around the body. So think of choreography, for example. So epidemiologically, Huntington's is much more uncommon than Parkinson's disease and unfortunately has a very poor prognosis. So now to compare the two disease processes together. Parkinson's disease has a late onset, involves a slowing of movements and it's idiopathic in nature. Whereas Huntington's on the other hand has an earlier onset, consists of continuous rapid movements and is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. So now to move on to the symptoms of both diseases and what makes them different. So Parkinson's, the cardinal symptoms of bradykinesia rigidity and tremor. So to discuss each of these in turn, bradykinesia is the slowness of initiating movement. A patient with Parkinson's disease has a progressive fatigue in both amplitude and speed of repetitive movements, so meaning that upon undertaking repeated movements in the effective limb, as time goes over, they'll become increasingly fatigued and the amplitude at which they move will decrease over time. So Speaking metaphorically, it's like it progressively gets worse. It continuously declines, even as the movement carries on. So rigidity is the increase of muscular tone. This is an important feature relating to the clinical examination, which we'll discuss further on in the video. So now to move on to the other symptoms of Parkinson's, which present later on and are not, strictly speaking, the cardinal signs. So an expressionless face, which is a feature seen as it progresses because you get facial bradykinesia. So the individual will become increasingly less able to move the facial muscles, giving them a sort of mask-like appearance. The next one is a shuffling gait, 
So the individual loses their ability to walk normally. And upon watching them walk, they sort of shuffle along in small steps because they can't control the amplitude of their movements and therefore cannot control the ability to walk as normal. And then a flexed stooping posture. So this works in tandem with the shuffling gait. That's why it's also sort of referred to as a propulsive gait because the individual, once they start moving, they have to keep moving and they shuffle along. And then another sign is dementia. So we'll talk about why in the following pathophysiology slides. So then to move on to the symptoms of Huntington's disease. So as we've already discussed, the main symptom is chorea. So chorea, again, to reiterate, is the involuntary continuous movement that we described earlier in the presentation. So think of the word choreography. The individual looks like they're dancing because of the nature of the involuntary movements that they're undertaking. So the next major symptom is progressive dementia. Another symptom is severe psychiatric disturbances. So these will all be covered. Why they occur in the pathophysiology section coming along now. So to relate to the pathophysiology and etiology, we'll start with Parkinson's. So Parkinson's is idiopathic in nature. It's characterized by a degeneration of the dopamine producing neurons in the pars compactor of the substantia nigra and the deposition of Lewy bodies. So Lewy bodies are small protein deposits consisting of alpha synuclein. So to explain the role of dopamine, it has an excitatory effect on the direct pathway and it inhibits the indirect pathway. So to put it simply, it allows for the control of the amplitude of wanted movements and inhibits the unwanted movements. So in Parkinson's, less dopamine is available. So as a result, the direct pathway becomes underactive and the indirect pathway becomes overactive. So this, therefore, together causes the symptoms seen in Parkinson's disease. So in order to think about the role of dopamine, think of it in an analogy. When you're driving a car, you use the steering wheel. If you're driving along a left turn, you turn the wheel left and it makes the car move to the left. So this is like the direct pathway. It controls the wanted movement and it inhibits the unwanted movement. The unwanted movement in this case would be the car veering right and therefore crashing. But here, as it, again, as there's less dopamine, the direct pathway, the wanted movement, the left turn is unavailable and the indirect pathway becomes more prevalent. And so in this analogy, this metaphor, the individual will be unable to steer the car properly. So now to move on to the pathophysiology of Huntington's disease. So Huntington's disease, as we've established, is inherited in an autosomal dominance pattern. It's caused by a CAG trinucleotide triplet repeat expansion on chromosome 4 on the Huntington gene. And it's a degenerative disease of the neurons found in the neostriatum. So these striatal neurons have a widespread effect on cortical function. This therefore leads to the symptoms described previously. So chorea. So the neurons project to the basal ganglia. As we've established, the basal ganglia controls the amplitude of movements. Degeneration here affects the indirect pathway most. And so, chorea, the unwanted sporadic movement occurs because the indirect pathway inhibits unwanted movements. However, if it's degenerated, it can't do this. And so, you get unwanted movements because they're not being stopped. And therefore, you get the chorea. So the second symptom is dementia. Because as cortical function degenerates on the whole, memory loss occurs because the striatal neurons have such a wide effect. And then the third and final symptom is psychiatric disturbances. So this is caused by the action of the gene on the neurons. So as the gene's defective, the way that it's expressed on the striatal neurons is to cause psychiatric disturbances as well as the symptoms described previously. So now to talk about the clinical examination and history. So the most important aspect is watching the patients and listening to them intently. That will give you more information than an examination and a history alone would. So for Parkinson's, observe the gaze as they walk in. Are they shuffling? Are they walking normally? When you test the tone in the arms, you'll feel a cogwheel and motion of movement. And the patient will have a tremor at rest. 
So now to talk about Huntington's disease. So in Huntington's, the patient may appear fidgety at first because the chorea is subtle early in the disease, so it's not particularly well defined. So now we're talking about the history. Parkinson's disease, the tremor will be noticed by the patients. Perhaps they drop something. Perhaps they'll be unable to walk normally. Perhaps they'll have noticed themselves that they're shaking and they can't control it. They may have a loss of balance and they may perhaps present with a fall. And they may have a slowness in their speech and memory loss. So then for Huntington's, they may have a family history of the disease or of early onset dementia and early death in their family. They may have a big behavioural change and memory loss. And then also they may notice any chorea. Or if they, they themselves don't notice, their family members might suddenly notice that they've developed this sort of twitchy, fidgety movement. So then just tips relating to the OSCE for the neurological exam. Remember the general inspection and look closely for the chorea and the tremor and be mindful of cogwheel and motion when you're testing tone because it's a useful sign to help diagnose Parkinson's and therefore if you had to differentiate between the two diseases, the cogwheel and motion would be a good sign in order to help you make that diagnosis. So then summary, we'll come back to the questions that we had at the start and talk about them in a little bit more depth. So what have you learned? So question one, what are the cardinal signs of Parkinson's disease? Is it chorea, dystonia and tics? Is it a shuffling gait, dysphasia and nystagmus? Is it bradykinesia, rigidity and tremor? Or is it hearing loss, memory loss and falls? So again, take a moment to pause the video and think of the key major symptoms presented, the first and foremost signs. So the correct answer is C, bradykinesia, rigidity and tremor. They're the three cardinal signs of Parkinson's. They're the earliest signs shown and therefore the most diagnostic. So the next question is Huntington's disease is caused by a degeneration of striatal neurons, a CAG triplet expansion, damage to the cerebral cortex or head injury. So again, think of the primary cause, not the effect. So the correct answer to this question is B, a CAG triplet expansion. Huntington's is caused by this genetic defect on chromosome 4. The effect of this is A. So the cause is B, but the effect is A. The effect of the degeneration of the CAG triplet expansion on chromosome 4 causes the degeneration of the striatal neurons. And then third and final question. Huntington's disease is A, an akinetic rigid syndrome, B, a type of epilepsy, C, autosomal recessive, or D, a dyskinesia. So again, think of the symptoms. So the correct answer is D, a dyskinesia, because the chorea, the major symptom in Huntington's disease, is a type of dyskinesia. Remember A is Parkinson's disease, and C is incorrect because Huntington's is an autosomal dominant disorder. So that marks the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. Hopefully this has been useful, and hopefully you now have a better understanding of the pathophysiology of Parkinson's and Huntington's disease.